on the rise. Uh, there's no question that what is going on in our country and around the world with globalism, with the advance of really the open advance of what has for years been called the New World Order, but is also known by a variety of other names right now. They're calling it the Great Reset. They're calling it Build Back Better. Those of you who remember one of our earlier films called Secret Mysteries of America's Beginnings, uh, Part 1, The New Atlantis. The New Atlantis was an early name for the New World Order. The idea that Atlantis of old was some kind of utopian society before it was destroyed by the Great Flood, the Great Deluge. If you read writings, we go over all, all of that in the film about Plato and the Critias, etc. Well, the whole concept of the New Atlantis and the New World Order are virtually one and the same thing, but they've got a whole variety of names for it. I remember when we interviewed Peter Dawkins, who was the leading expert on Sir Francis Bacon, and a lot of this had to do with Bacon's vision of really a scientific world order, the advancement of learning, education, and so on that would develop modern science, which is exactly what we're seeing. And now you've got people like Klaus Schwab talking about the fourth industrial revolution, which is taking technology to the next level even beyond what we've seen thus far, but also using it as a control system, a system of tyranny and control. And one of the books about Bacon by Peter Dawkins, it was called Building Paradise, the Freemasonic and Rosicrucian Six Days Work. That's what, they, that's what uh, it's called in some circles, and that's the, the name of a particular book, one that we went over in the series. Well, anyway, these are things that I think about as I'm watching what's happening now with the World Economic Forum, with uh, Biden coming out talking about a new world order. Now you have this quote. They're, they're becoming more and more bold. The, the World Government Summit 2022 from day one, this is here just, it was streamed live back on March 29th. And uh, this female speaker comes out day one, and here's what she says. Listen. Highnesses, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very, very good morning on what is the first official day of World Government Summit here at Dubai Expo 2020. And the title of this session, Are We Ready for a new world order. Well, the organizers here are nothing if not ambitious. This is, I think you will agree, a daunting subject for discussion at just after 9 a.m. on a Wednesday morning here in the relative calm of Expo 2020. But tackle it, we must, because I believe what is clear is that we have hit an inflection point. We are certainly living in a unique age of uncertainty and volatility in global affairs. Okay, so you can hear right there, right off the bat, day one at the World Government Summit, and this is with the World Economic Forum, this is Klaus Schwab, this is all of these globalist leaders, most of whom, let's understand, or many of whom, are not elected officials. They're not people who were voted into office. These are people who have a lot of money. They've got billions and billions of dollars somehow, and they are influencing politicians. They are often buying them. They're educating them. They're giving them the money so that they can get into positions of power. This is what George Soros does. This is something that goes all the way back to the early part of the 20th century. It's why we are one of the reasons why we're making our film on the Reese Committee, because if you listen to the testimony of Norman Dodd on the Reese Committee uh, and what they discovered about the big tax-exempt foundations, the way that they manipulate finance, they, they develop their own, for example, they want to rewrite history, and they could not get the established historians to cooperate with them. So what they did is they created their own school of historians. They found young people. They flew them out of the country, reportedly, to London. 
told them what they wanted them to do, to rewrite America's history books, uh, to, to basically turn systematically our country away from its biblical foundation toward a Marxist worldview, and basically said to them that they're going to give them the money so that they can finance their academic career, and then they're going to use their money and their influence, etc., through their networking to make sure that these individuals are the ones who get the positions in the colleges and the universities so they'll be in charge of everything. And while they did this at the level of education, it seems very, very clear to those who have studied all of this with Soros. I mean, Soros, he's, he's just one of many links in this chain. You got the Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation, the Carnegie Endowment, you've got Guggenheim, his foundation. Uh, and of course, now in modern times, you've got George Soros, you've got Bill and Melinda Gates, uh, and you've got Klaus Schwab. You've got all of these guys, and they're investing their money and following the same model that was set forth by Carnegie and Rockefeller and Ford in the early part of the 20th century, where they develop their own school of experts, politicians, and leaders and then they put them into positions of power using their money and their political influence. And then those are the people now who have been flooded into our system. This is why you've got so many people talking about how there are district attorneys across the country who have been financed by George Soros. And what they're doing is they're refusing to prosecute certain crimes. This is how they're allowing our country right now to be flooded with all of these illegal immigrants because the people who are in power who would normally prosecute this and prevent it from happening have been told to basically stand down and just allow the country to be flooded with foreigners, knowing that it's going to do great harm to our economy, to culture, to all sorts of problems are going to come about as a result. And that's what they want. They want a certain amount of chaos and mayhem because through all of that, that's how they are planning to establish their new order of things, their new normal. That's another name for the new world order, the new normal. And yet, what are we finding with this new normal? We're finding the advancement of immorality, just gross, extreme immorality with this entire LGBT movement. We posted an interview not long ago. Uh, you can find it. We put the link on our Facebook page, but it's on YouTube. You can also find it at our Patreon page. An interview with Randy Engel. Randy Engel, who is an author. She is an investigative journalist, and she's author of the book, uh, The Right of Sodomy, Homosexuality and the Roman Catholic Church. Very, very troubling work. Very disturbing subject matter. But when you consider the links to Rome with a lot of this globalism that's going on and the ecumenical movement gathering in all of the pagan world religions, because that's what you find with this World Economic Forum and this World Government Summit. You look out at the audience there and you're seeing all of these different leaders from different parts of the world and all these different world belief systems, different religions. And so when we're reading in the book of Revelation, where it says in Revelation chapter 18, verse 2, where the angel cries, and it says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. You just think about how all of these globalist leaders have cooperated with this immoral agenda so that they're pushing sodomy all over the world. All over the world. They're promoting this whole concept of LGBT rights, the rights of sodomites, etc. And then after Mystery Babylon is destroyed, which we know it's simply a matter of time before this is going to happen, uh, in Revelation 19, verse 1, it says, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor 
and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Now notice how it talks about how the great whore, Mystery Babylon, has corrupted the earth, not just a single country or a few countries or whatever, but corrupted the whole earth with her fornication, her sexual immorality. That is what we are witnessing in our day. We're witnessing this at an unprecedented level. In centuries past, you've had individual cities, individual societies that have become corrupted and then they've been overthrown. Now we are literally watching in our lifetime the systematic corruption, immoral, ungodly, evil, wicked, sodomite corruption of the entire earth. And certainly there are still parts of the earth that are resisting all of this, that are refusing to go along with it, but the corruption has spread rapidly in such a very short period of time. I mean, it's really quite unbelievable. But it goes back to the post-World War II generation. Of course, we talk about this from the perspective of the Kinsey reports, but then I still think that a very, very significant event that we're going to be talking about in our upcoming documentary on American Jesuits, we're going to be talking about the role of the Jesuit general Pedro Arupe. Pedro Arupe in 1969 commissioned a Jesuit priest named John McNeil who was a homosexual priest, a homosexual Jesuit, and he commissioned him to effectively write the book The Church and the Homosexual, which he did and published around 1970. And from that point on, you find the Jesuits and Rome helping to advance this homosexual agenda in America and ultimately throughout the world. And it's having a devastating impact. I mean, I believe that this had everything to do with the outbreak of the HIV, uh, the AIDS virus in 1981. And now it's reported that over 36 million people around the world have died from the AIDS pandemic. It's just unbelievable what has happened. And we're watching the progress of this more and more. It's an uncomfortable topic, but unfortunately we have to confront it because if we don't, then the danger is it could overrun our entire country. Right now, uh, it's be being reported, Fox News, that we kind of all knew was not really a conservative news organization. I have warned for years that Fox is really a conservative oracle of Rome. And, and it, it's just, it's information control for the conservative camp. And now you've got Sean Hannity, who is supporting Bruce Jenner in drag as a Fox News contributor, now officially on Fox News. Fox News has officially thrown their support behind this transgender agenda, which is utterly immoral. It is a complete distortion and perversion of God's creation. The scripture says very clearly, the man shall not put on that clothing that pertaineth unto the woman. All they that do so are an abomination unto the Lord. And yet, sadly, that is being normalized, and that's all part of the new normal. But what they're really trying to do, folks, is to destroy the authority of the Bible, the law of God, the authority of Christianity in Western civilization, really throughout the world. This war, that's why I say these are antichrist powers that are on the rise. Klaus Schwab, all of these groups, they are antichrists. And they are, they are, right now, they are beginning the process of trying to fulfill Revelation 17 and verse 14 where it says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We know how the story ends 
brothers and sisters. We know where it's all going to end up. But it's, and verse 22 says, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. That's key because right now a huge part of this uh, globalist movement that has unfolded in the 20th century. And, and let's understand something. There, there have been groups and powers that have been against the gospel from the first century, we know. And in every century, there's been some measure of hostility in one way or another. What's unique about our time is the Parliament of World Religions that happened back in 1893. I don't know of any other time in history where you had all of these leaders of the various religions of the world all come together like they did back in 1893 and begin this process of ecumenical blending of all the world religions as though they are one and the same to begin that whole line of argumentation. And of course, we know it was then furthered with the publication of Vatican Council II in the 1960s, largely at the instigation of the Jesuits. They're, they're the key authors of Vatican Council II. And I believe that this is, in no small part, what is being referenced in Revelation 18 and verse 2, because the Scripture tells us that what's behind these pagan religions, what's behind all of the idols of the pagan world, are demonic powers. It's what the Apostle Paul says when he's writing to the Corinthians. He says, I tell you which the sacrifice, the sacrifice which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons or devils and not to God. So right there, we're being told. Uh, you find passages throughout the Old Testament that say the same thing. That when they're sacrificing to the idols, they sacrifice to devils. And so when we get to Revelation 18 and verse 2, where it says, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird, I have believed for years that that is a direct reference to Rome gathering, as we saw Pope John Paul II do uh, back in 1988, where all of these world religions came together in Assisi, Italy. And the Pope told them that they're all praying to the same God. So become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit. All the idols come together through with and through Mystery Babylon. And we see Rome really being at the very center of that. Rome is instigating it. There's no question. But we also know that Antichrist is more complex. We have 1 John 2 and verse 18 that says, Little children, it is the last time... And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. But there's no question that this new world order is seeking to replace the, what, what they perceive as the old world order, which is the order whereby Christianity and Western civilization dominated most all the nations of the earth, through the rise of the British Empire, through the development of the United States of America. By the time you get to the beginning of the 20th century, Christian countries were the most powerful countries in the world. They still are. They still are collectively. But they have been infiltrated. They have been sabotaged. Uh, that's why, you know, Right now, this situation in the Ukraine, you've got a lot of people who are, they're, they're buying into a lot of the deception about Russia, and that supposedly Russia is committing all of these atrocities, but it's, uh, it's unbelievable. The, uh, you know, there's an article with the Daily Expose that has the headline 
uh, which says Ukrainian civilians being used as human shields. And actually, the full title says used as human shields continues. Continues. Why? Because this had been reported before. The article says, as the humanitarian situation in Ukraine declined, UN officials briefed the Security Council on 7 March. The Russian Federation permanent representative argued that safety for civilians in Ukraine is not a problem for Russia because, quote, we are not bombarding them, but rather it is the Ukrainian radicals and neo-Nazis who were holding civilians hostage in cities and using them as human shields, not allowing them to leave despite the fact that there were humanitarian corridors. In other words, the humanitarian corridors are basically escape routes that the Russians are claiming they provided so that the civilian population could get to safety. That's the whole idea. And it has been claimed that the Atsov battalion neo-Nazis who fight for the Ukrainian government, that they're the ones who are committing a lot of these atrocities because they're brutalizing not only the Russians, but their own people because they're holding their own people hostage. They won't allow them to leave. That's the claim that's being made. That claim is also supported by a lot of on-the-ground evidence being videotaped and reported by the independent journalist Patrick Lancaster, who we've mentioned before. You can find him on YouTube. He's got his own YouTube channel. I'm pretty sure he's going to be on things like Brideon and on Rumble, etc. Uh, but I, I've watched several stories by him on YouTube yesterday. And yes, he's reporting that... In fact, a lot of these atrocities are being committed, and the people on the ground who are in the Ukraine, many of them are claiming that, no, it's not Russia that's doing these things. It is the Zelensky government. It is the Ukraine itself. The Ukrainian government, they're the ones committing these atrocities. But I would encourage anyone to do your own research, look into this, don't jump on any particular bandwagon, investigate both sides of these arguments because there's a lot of deception happening over there. Now, my interest in all of this as an American, as a U.S. citizen, is I don't want to see our country dragged into World War III in the middle of a confusing political propaganda mess that that really this situation at best is there there's all sorts of contradictory ev evidence that's been reported that's been claimed back and forth back and forth i just don't think the united states we don't need to commit to military support for ukraine because that could very well lead to world war three now, personally, I believe this Zelensky government, this Ukrainian government that's in power, is an evil government. I don't trust them as far as I could throw them. And remember, their ambition is to join the European Union and effectively NATO. That's their ambition. It's not about free and independent Ukraine. And the, the media is covering up their atrocities, and they're taking what is being reported as atrocities committed by the Ukraine and they're blaming Russia for what the Ukraine government thugs and the Azov battalion neo-Nazis are doing. And a lot of this is hostility against Russia because Russia has been trying to reclaim its Christian foundation. Now, whenever I talk about this, I'll usually get a message or an email or something somewhere from somebody who wants to tell me that well, the Russian Orthodox, they're, they're legalistic and they're not really Christian and this kind of thing. Uh, and yes, listen, I understand all the theological issues with the Russian Orthodox Church. I, well, I understand many of them. But the core elements of the Orthodox belief is faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, faith in the Bible as the Word of God. Do they have peculiar doctrines that are problematic? Well, of course they do. I don't deny that, and I'm not trying to endorse those doctrines. But they are taking a stand as a country for Christianity as they understand it. That's not what's happening in the European Union. The European Union is not even trying to represent Christianity. They are trying to overthrow Christianity. 
They hate Christianity. That's why they're promoting sodomy and Sharia law and trying to advance the Muslims and, and fill up all the countries with as many Muslim migrants as they possibly can to sabotage Christian civilization so that what had been for centuries the Christian standard is going to be done away with and replaced by something else, some kind of socialist Sharia form of government. You know, we, we generally call it globalism. Uh, it has also been called the red-green axis, red for Marxism, green for Islam. But Christianity is to be overthrown. And that is Bible-based Christianity is to be over, overthrown. Anything, anything, any, any right, any belief about morality and goodness, etc., based on the Bible is to be utterly eradicated. That's where they're headed. And that's why the transgender and homosexual movement is so important because it's one of the cornerstone issues for the radical left. And that's why they got it into the courts. The, the purpose of things like gay marriage and the transgender rulings is to declare that rights do not come from God. It is a, a complete denial of the constitutional view our American U.S. constitutional view that rights come from God. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to sabotage the whole idea that rights come from God. And they want rights to come from judges and lawyers, unelected officials, a handful of elites who decide everything for humanity. And that's influencing not only American law, it influences international law. The whole concept of international law began as a Christian idea. It was based on the idea that God's moral code is written on the hearts of all men, according to Romans chapter 2. That's where it began. But by allowing these socialists and these communists and now the Muslims to get involved, of course, they have their own ideas about right and wrong. And they reject the authority of God, and they certainly reject the authority of God according to the Bible. That's the key. The Bible is the key. They have to overthrow the authority of Scripture. That's why they've been working overtime. That's why all the information we've documented about, and see, I, I don't believe this movement just began after World War II. You find the beginnings of it at the early part of the 20th century, even before World War I. Remember, Karl Marx publishes the Communist Manifesto in 1848. By 1881, you have the revision committee with Westcott and Hort. Now, one of Marx's principles of subversion is that if you want to overthrow a country, the rewriting of history is the first battleground. That's the first thing you've got to do. You've got to rewrite the history of a country. And then you take away their history and their heritage, and from there, they are easily overthrown. That, I believe, is what the globalist powers, the powers in Rome, and those who have cooperated with them have done through Westcott and Hort and the critical text. They rewrote the history of the Bible. And they said, well, what we always thought was the history of the Bible is wrong. Actually, the Bible was changed and rewritten by these bishops at Antioch between 250 and 350 A.D., and they added all of this stuff and the Bible's actually been corrupted until, until we get to the 19th century. And now we're going to fix it, but we actually can't fix it because nobody really knows what the Bible says anyway. So we're just going to keep making ongoing changes that are never-ending changes that have no point of conclusion other than that we don't really know what Jesus said, as Dan Wallace and the Jesuit general have both reported. We don't really know what Jesus said, so nobody really knows what his teachings are, so we shouldn't cling to any particular teaching too much. That's where all of this is headed, to sabotage Christian civilization by taking away the very foundation, which is the Word of God. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's what Jesus said. But as the scripture warns, if the foundations be removed, what can the righteous do? We have no firm foundation to stand on without the word of God, without God's 
Holy Scripture, divine revelation that has been given to us. It's why the fight for the Bible is so important. It's why it's so important. Because from that, from sabotaging the Scripture in the late 19th, early 20th century, that has given, that, that has opened the door for all of this anti-Christian, socialist, communist, and now pagan invasion and Islam and now saying that, well, all religions have to be one and the same, and that means the Bible is no better than the Koran, and so now we can have politicians being sworn in on the Koran, etc., because it's just the same as the Bible. That's where all of these arguments come from. And next it appears they are moving what could very well be a mark of the beast system forward by trying to destroy cash, the use of cash, the use of, of physical money, and to replace it with digital money. Here's another quote from a woman here at the World Government Summit in Dubai. Listen to what she says. What underpins a world order is always the financial system. I, I was very privileged. My father was an advisor to Nixon when they came off the gold standard in 71, and so I was brought up with a kind of inside view of how very important the financial structure is to absolutely everything else. And what we're seeing in the world today, I think, is we're on the brink of a dramatic change where we are about to, and I'll say this boldly, we're about to abandon the traditional system of money and accounting and introduce a new one. And the new one, the new accounting, is what we call blockchain. It means digital. It means having an almost perfect record of every single transaction that happens in the economy, which will give us far greater clarity over what's going on. It also raises huge dangers in terms of the balance of power between states and citizens. In my opinion, we're going to need a digital constitution of human rights if we're going to have digital money. Uh, but also, this new money will be sovereign in nature. Most people think that digital money is crypto and private, but what I see are superpowers introducing digital currency. The Chinese were the first. The U.S. is on the brink, I think, of moving in the same direction. The Europeans have committed to that as well. And the question is, will that new system of digital money and digital accounting accommodate the competing needs of the citizens of all these locations so that every human being has a chance to have a better life. All right, now whenever you hear them say every human being, always remember every human being does not really mean every human being. Uh, the groups and the individuals that they do not like, they will discriminate against and they will keep them down, put them down and make sure that they don't have any way of getting wherever they don't want them to be. Uh, that, that's the case. Uh, they will target groups that they want to advance. So every human being will be their pet groups that they want to use as weapons against the Christian populations of the world. Whether that's homosexuals, whether that's transgenders, or whether that's Muslims, or who knows what else they'll come up with, they will choose groups that are diametrically opposed to a Christian value system and to Christian teaching, and those will be the groups that they mean whenever they say everybody. We need a system where everybody wins, not just the Christians in Western civilization. That's really what it means. But the question is, does God want the ambition of Christian people to be to make everybody equal to Christianity? Theologically, we know the answer is no. What about temporally, in terms of their wealth and well-being? Well, see, the problem with the argument that we should be focusing on humanitarian endeavors while ignoring the gospel, because that's what they want. They want you to stop quoting the scripture and just take out your wallet and give money. That's what they want us to do. Just give money to help build their schools and their infrastructure, etc., and honor their pagan traditions, leave them in spiritual darkness, in an unsaved condition, but just 
make life better for them in terms of their housing and their travel and communication and their entertainment and all the rest of this, that that's what we should be focusing on as a country. But you see, that's not why America was founded to begin with. America was founded, as the Mayflower Compact says, for the advancement of the Christian religion. And we're sent out into the world by the Lord Jesus Christ not to make everybody's life financially better. Because what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Now we're sent out in the world to preach the gospel to every creature, to make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, to teach them to observe all things whatsoever the Lord Jesus Christ commanded. And that means they've got to be taught the whole counsel of God. Because Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And the only way any person can live according to every word of God is to have the word of God in their own language somehow, or to be able to read it somehow. So that is the mission of Christianity. But what they're doing, what these globalists are doing, is they're hijacking the historically Christian countries of the world and using them for this Marxist, socialist, globalist ambition. And if they go to digital currency, what it will do is it will give them a control system. They'll be able to control everything that everybody does, where, where they can shut down your buying ability. They'll, they'll say, okay, you can't buy or sell because you have opinions that we don't like. And they could use this as a weapon against the Christian population. They could say, okay, well, you're telling people that homosexuality is wrong. Well, we're going to shut down your spending ability. You're no longer going to be able to use your digital credits, whatever they are. Because you're not telling people what we want you to tell them. So many people are very rightly warning that this will turn into a control system. Because as long as you have cash and as long as you have, you know, gold and silver coins and as long as you have material currency, people can do business one way or another. And there's only so much control that government entities can have over what people are doing as long as there's cash in circulation. But once everything becomes credit or a cashless society, that channels all the power, all the control into the hands of the state. And now they can turn on and off your credit. They're, they're already doing this in China. It is moving things in the direction of a mark of the beast type system where they will be able to say no man can buy or sell unless you do whatever they want you to do. Believe whatever they want you to believe. Bow before whatever and whoever they want you to bow for. So we've got to be on our guard with this. We've got to recognize as we see these, these things coming to pass that the Lord has warned us about these things. And this is where it's very important that we understand we are not called to cooperate with a corrupt and evil government. We can obey the powers of government in as much as they obey the general commandments of God. But if they openly violate God's law and they compel us to cooperate with them, there we say with the apostles of old, we ought to obey God rather than men. Praise the Lord. All right, brethren, that is going to do it for us today. That is our show. We'll stop it there. But we will be back next time as the Lord...